years ago, a majority of people, many women included, would have thought it unnatural, if not immoral, to permit women to participate in sports. Today, women's participation is widespread and accepted by most. However, there are still many sports and sport-related institutions and organizations that have not achieved full equality. Some sports, such as football or boxing, encourage very little female participation, although even these so-called masculine sports are changing. Women's boxing, for example, will probably be included in the Olympic Games by the end of this decade. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, when sports and physical education programs were first organized in North America, women were forbidden from participating for so-called scientific or medical reasons. Physicians as a group often spoke out against female athleticism, using the argument that physical activity would damage reproduction. Others claimed that it was quite simply unnatural for women to participate in sports. Little real evidence was provided to support these claims. In truth, the so-called evidence was more a reflection of physicians' cultural assumptions about women's place in society in general. The 1920s and 1930s witnessed a short golden age in women's sports. Individual athletes and teams or leagues formed to support female athletics. Track and field, tennis, softball, programs in physical education, and other activities were encouraged, at least for those women lucky enough to have the time and money to participate. There was even a women's Olympic Games movement in the 1920s and 1930s. At one point, the regular Olympic Games organized by the International Olympic Committee, IOC, became concerned that the women's Olympics would gain enough power to challenge the superiority of the IOC's Olympics. As a result, the IOC included a few more women's events in their games, although not many. The golden age of women's sports was followed by a long drought. The post-World War II era was one of very conservative traditional family values in North America. However, in the 1970s, the current boom in women's sports began. One of the driving forces in the movement was East Bloc countries, particularly the Soviet Union and East Germany, both of which encouraged female athletes at the highest level, the Olympic Games. Female athletes with strong and muscular bodies emerged on the international sports stage. At first, this raised concern among the male-dominated sports establishment. However, after years of struggle, the muscular and strong female athletic body has become common in international sport. In the late 19th century, the founder of the modern Olympic Games, Pierre de Coubertin, said that the sight of women participating in sport was an affront to the human eye and unnatural. We've come a long way since then. Sport and Television There is little question that television has radically changed the sporting world. Television has done more than just make existing sports more accessible to a mass audience. It has argued that the very nature of sport and spectators' experiences of sport has been shaped by the medium of television. The first televised sporting event took place on May 17, 1939. A baseball game between two American schools, Princeton and Columbia, marked the beginning of a new era in sport. The first broadcast, however, was not of particularly high quality. Viewers could hardly see the players on the television screen, the technology at the time being of very low quality. In addition, very few people owned television sets at the time. Only 400 TV sets were in circulation, and the average cost of $600 made owning a set impossible for most people. This situation would soon change. Television as a popular and affordable medium grew rapidly in the 1940s and 1950s. By the end of the 1950s, American televised sport entered a golden age. It was during this period of time that major sporting organizations, such as professional leagues and major amateur organizations, such as the International Olympic Committee, IOC, realized the benefits of television. Not only could TV make competitions available for a huge number of spectators, it could actually make money for these organizations. Television companies, in turn, could make money by attracting viewers and selling advertising space at increased rates. Television and sport entered what some observers call a symbiotic or mutually beneficial relationship. The business relationship developed between the American TV company ABC and the Olympic Games is a clear example of the TV sport symbiosis. In the 1960s and 1970s, ABC recognized the importance of using international sport to attract viewers. By being recognized as the Olympic network, ABC quickly rose from being the third biggest commercial network in the U.S., to being the leading network. At the same time, ABC paid higher and higher rights fees to the IOC, and the IOC in turn began to take a more commercial and professional approach to the Olympic Games. The ABC role model has paved the way for other television networks around the world. Today, television rights pay for the majority of Olympic Games expenses. 
The television and sport relationship has come a long way since the first Princeton-Columbia baseball game. Today, more people experience sport as spectators through the medium of television than they do as regular participants in sport. The television and sport relationship then presents a bit of a paradox. While on one hand it has made sport more visible for more people, it has perhaps done so at the expense of actual participation in sport. Nike Nike and its swoosh corporate symbol are among the most recognized brand names in the world, alongside McDonald's, Coca-Cola, and Disney. Starting in 1964 as a sports shoe outlet, the company grew to become the market leader in footwear and apparel. Nike has since diversified into a range of activities, including sports event promotion. Owned by Phil Knight, Nike has become synonymous with world-class sport, especially through its sponsorship of events and elite athletes such as Michael Jordan and Tiger Woods. Nike is so ever-present in the sports consumers' minds that a survey conducted during the Atlanta Summer Olympic Games in 1996 revealed an extremely high awareness of Nike, despite the fact that Nike was not an official sponsor of the Games. Nike's success has, to a great extent, been due to the fact that the company and its swoosh symbol have become ubiquitous in consumers' minds. Nike has even run television commercials without even mentioning its own name, being confident enough that the checkmark swoosh is more than enough to make the company known. Phil Knight has been the main inspiration behind Nike and its corporate direction. A competent, although not elite, middle-distance runner at the University of Oregon, Knight went on to Harvard Business School, where the Nike idea emerged out of a paper he developed for a class on entrepreneurship. Knight's former coach, Bill Bowerman, developed lightweight running shoes that became the new company's trademark in the early days. From these modest beginnings, Nike eventually grew to become the sports giant it is today. Ironically, part of Nike's status in the world of competitive sports merchandising has come from the attention it's received by critics. A short article published in the early 1990s in Harper's Magazine quickly mushroomed into an international outcry against Nike's practice of placing their factories in underdeveloped countries and paying workers below subsistence wages. Nike quickly responded to the criticisms with a number of tactics to either divert attention away from the criticisms, ones that Knight, interestingly, at first denied, or by acknowledging the practices but claiming Nike was cleaning up its act. In many cases, Nike has made an effort to create better working conditions for those in underdeveloped countries making shoes and other merchandise. However, the overall effect of Nike's changes is not known, and several groups around the world regularly check and often criticize Nike's labor practices. Nike's recent marketing extravaganzas include a $200 million U.S. deal with the Brazilian National Soccer Federation. It has been rumored that Knight's ego has much to do with Nike's marketing strategies. Some critics have suggested that Knight's hidden agenda is no less than controlling sports marketing and merchandising throughout the world. Nike's corporate headquarters in Oregon reflect these aspirations. Nike's buildings and surrounding grounds are constructed very much like a religious cathedral, only with elite athletes and Knight himself as the gods. Arthur Ashe Arthur Ashe, 1943 to 1993, was one of the most exceptional tennis players in the history of the sport. Born in Richmond, Virginia, Ashe served in the United States Army and had a good early amateur career. By the end of his life in 1993, Ashe was recognized not only for his tennis, but also for his political campaigns on behalf of racial equality in the United States, Haiti, and South Africa. Also, as a victim of AIDS, Ashe campaigned for AIDS research near the end of his life. When Ash turned professional in 1969, he was an African-American player in a sport completely dominated by whites. At the peak of his career in the 1970s, Ash won the Australian Open, Wimbledon, and doubles titles at the French and Australian Opens. Interestingly, Ash encouraged young blacks not to waste their energies on sports. Instead, he recommended channeling energy into academic and vocation-related studies. His recommendation seems appropriate to this day. While it is the case that sports can provide positive role models and encourage hard work and discipline, it is also the case that many young athletes dream unrealistically of professional careers at the exclusion of school. The odds of successfully making a professional league are statistically next to impossible. Despite his own success, Ash recognized this. Mindful of racism in American society, Ash always thought of his own career in terms of the general experience of blacks in America. He wrote several books recounting these ideas. Ash's historical writing on the history of African Americans in sport spawned a multimedia series, A Hard Road to Glory. 
Today, while a few more blacks have been successful in sports traditionally dominated by whites, it is still the case that whites dominate. The recent successes of athletes like the Williams sisters in tennis and Tiger Woods in golf sometimes conceal the fact that these sports are still predominantly white. According to Ash's thinking, it would be a mistake to take one role model such as Tiger Woods and from that conclude that race problems in sport no longer exist. Like any institution, race relations in sport should be thought of for their long-term trends, not individual exceptions. Arthur Ashe contracted the HIV virus through a blood transfusion and died of AIDS in 1993, aged 50. Well, since his death, he has become revered and respected. In the 1980s, near the end of his life, he was unpopular for his ideas. However, his combination of political campaigning and athletic prowess made him a revered figure in American history. Bjorn Borg the professional career of tennis player Bjorn Borg was one of the most interesting ones in recent sports history. Borg's success in his sport came at an early age. Borg won Wimbledon when he was only 20 years old. However, by the time he was 26 and in the prime of his career, Borg inexplicably retired from professional tennis. Borg, who began playing tennis at the age of 9, was the number one ranked junior player by the age of 14 and had won the Italian and French Open titles at the age of 18. These were the first of several major championships won by Borg in the late 1970s and early 1980s. Probably his greatest achievement was a winning streak at Wimbledon that spanned five years. Between the years 1976 and 1982, Borg enjoyed almost complete dominance in competitive tennis. His retirement in 1983, then, was a bit of a puzzle. Although his tennis skills waned somewhat in the previous year, he was still one of the top players on the tour and only 26 years old. Even stranger was the fact that Borg refused to reveal the reasons for his retirement. Following his retirement, Borg encountered a number of personal problems, which kept him in the media spotlight, even though he was no longer playing competitive tennis. Five years after his retirement, an emergency hospital procedure saved his life. While Borg claimed he had food poisoning, it was suspected he had a barbiturate overdose. In 1991, Borg attempted to make a comeback on the professional tennis tour, only to fail miserably. His insistence on using a wooden racket at the time, when all of the world's top players were using synthetic fiber rackets, didn't help matters. At the same time, Borg's second wife attempted to commit suicide, and the couple divorced in 1993. Eventually, Borg disappeared into obscurity, and there is little news of his life today. These sad stories about the latter part of his career aside, Borg was an important figure in modern tennis history. He was the sport's first modern media star and icon. Teenage girls conferred upon him a status comparable to a rock star. His face adorned t-shirts and other merchandise, making him the most marketable tennis player in history. Borg's career was a catalyst for Swedish tennis players. Those who followed in his footsteps and held him up as their hero included tennis stars Mats Wielander and Stefan Edberg. Perhaps most important of all, Borg gave to the sport of tennis a degree of showmanship, visibility, and marketability that was used as a role model for the sport in future decades. Video designed by English7Levels.com Babe Didrikson Mildred Babe Didrikson, 1913-1956, was one of the most celebrated female athletes of the first half of the 20th century. Competing in the 1930s and 1940s when conventional attitudes regarding women's participation in sport dominated North American culture, Babe Didrikson rose to fame by dominating not just one, but a number of sports. Didrikson flouted conventional notions of femininity and proper female activity by excelling in field events such as javelin and shot put, in addition to traditionally male-dominated sports such as baseball, swimming, and golf. Interestingly, Didrikson would always have to battle popular accounts that attacked or questioned her femininity and sexuality. As a woman with a large, muscular, and athletic body, Didrikson was often accused of having an unfair advantage over other women, and often regarded as not being a real woman. Born in the state of Texas, Didrikson rose to athletic fame quickly, representing the USA in the 1932 Olympic Games in Los Angeles, where she won and set records in the javelin and 80-meter hurdles. Later in her career, Didrikson turned her athletic attention mainly to golf, a sport in which she was immensely successful. Interestingly, however, Didrikson tired of the popular innuendo regarding her unfeminine appearance and made a conscious effort to change her image in favor of a more traditionally feminine one. She donned dresses and makeup in place of her sweatpants and makeup-less appearance. Didrikson's controversial career underwent a twist when she fought the American Athletic Union, AAU, 
which had stripped her of her amateur sports status after she allowed her image to be used in endorsements for cars. When offered amateur status reinstatement, Didrikson refused, challenging what she believed to be the AAU's antiquated rules and regulations. Aside from her incredible athletic accomplishments, Didrikson is an important historical figure because of the challenge she made to the male-dominated institution of sport. Didrikson challenged those within the institution of sport to question gender values at a time when the political environment made it difficult to do so. Didrikson prefigured by several decades the challenges to sport made by other female athletes, such as Billie Jean King, Martine Navratilova, and Florence Griffith Joyner. Didrikson forced a re-examination of the meaning of sports, making many aware of the social and political importance of an institution typically not thought of as such. The Dubbin Inquiry The Dubbin Inquiry was a Canadian federal government inquiry into the state of amateur sport in Canada, more specifically into the use of performance-enhancing drugs by Canadian athletes. The inquiry followed in the footsteps of Canadian sprinter Ben Johnson's disqualification in the 1988 Seoul Olympics. The inquiry was named after Charles Dubbin, a Canadian judge who presided over the proceedings. Johnson won the Olympic men's 100-meter final in a world record time of 9.79 seconds. However, his post-race mandatory drug test was positive. Johnson was found to have taken the steroids to nozolol. The subsequent stripping of Johnson's gold medal turned into probably the most famous case of drug use in the history of sports. It also sent shock waves rippling through the Canadian sports establishment, with various members of government and the sport bureaucracy pointing fingers at each other. Many observers of the sports establishment around the world followed the Dubbin Inquiry and the Johnson case. Several countries were dealing with a growing problem of their own athletes using drugs to enhance performance, so the results of the inquiry were eagerly anticipated. The inquiry heard testimony from a large number of athletes, coaches, sports administrators, and others. The most interesting submissions were made by Johnson's coach, Charlie Francis, his physician, Jamie Astefan, and of course, from Johnson himself. The inquiry disclosed drug taking on a scale never before suspected. It was discovered that, besides the common practice of coaches encouraging athletes to take drugs, many others were guilty of turning a blind eye to the problem and ignoring it. In the aftermath of the inquiry, a new organization, the Canadian Centre for Drug-Free Sport, was created to combat the problem. This organization has taken various measures in its attempt to combat drug use by Canadian athletes. However, critics of the Dublin Inquiry have accused the inquiry of being little more than a government inquisition, the real purpose of which was to direct attention towards individual athletes and coaches and away from the government itself. Increasingly, in the 1980s, Sport Canada, the governing body responsible for the administration of elite amateur sport in Canada, had taken a success-oriented approach to Canadian sport, emphasizing winning medals above all other goals. The result, critics have pointed out, was to put immense pressure on Canadian athletes, leading in turn to drug use, among many other extreme measures, to enhance performance. The Dublin Inquiry, in other words, has had mixed reviews. A further indication of the effectiveness of the Dubbin Inquiry can be seen in the state of Canadian sport since the Inquiry. Despite attempts by the Canadian Centre for Drug-Free Sport to educate athletes and coaches on the dangers of drug use, there is little doubt that rampant drug use continues. This has led some observers of the Canadian sports scene to claim that drug use is less a reflection of individual athletes who cheat, but more a reflection of a cultural and institutional epidemic in sport. Drug use has perhaps become so common in the culture of elite sport that dealing with a problem by punishing individual athletes might be ineffective. FIFA Created in 1904 with seven member nations, FIFA, Federation Internationale de Football Association, is the international governing body of soccer. Soccer is the most widely watched and played game in the world. FIFA organizes the World Cup, which takes place every four years. In many ways, the development of FIFA follows the organization of the sport of football, soccer itself. At the start of the 20th century, it was primitive in its organization and loosely structured. However, by the end of the century, FIFA had affiliations in all six continents with over 170 member countries. Alongside the International Olympic Committee, FIFA is the largest sports organization in the world. At the time of FIFA's creation, soccer had gained a following in several countries, in large part due to British settlements. It was not until 1863 that the sports of soccer and rugby were formally separated in England. While both sports were important in British culture in the 19th century, it was soccer that took off around the world at a much more accelerated rate.
As the 20th century progressed, countries like Holland, Germany, Spain, Brazil, and many others became as good as, and in many cases better at the game than, the founding country. The World Cup began in 1930 in Uruguay. By then, FIFA had attained enough power and the game was so widespread that a world championship was justified. By the time the 1998 World Cup was staged in France, 112 countries competed. Despite the sport originating in England, that country did not win a World Cup until 1966. One notable exception to the soccer fanaticism that is seen in many countries around the world is the USA. There's always been a problem developing soccer in the country that dominates so many other professional and amateur sports. One of the main reasons for this is the country is inundated with its professional sports system. For one reason or another, the USA has opted for sports traditionally played in relatively few countries. American-style football, basketball, and what many consider to be the quintessential American sport, baseball. There is also the problem soccer presents for American television networks. Successful sports in the USA have usually been ones appropriate for commercial television. Soccer, with its two 45-minute halves and long, uninterrupted play, is less than ideal for commercials and advertising-based American television. The most recent evolution in soccer has been in the women's game. The 1999 Women's World Cup held in the USA was an unqualified success. Indeed, FIFA's president proclaimed that the future of football is female.